you find that you're getting behind. All right. So, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. This is uh, the edition of the book. Uh, it's got a full color illustration from Tennille, who is an artist commissioned to do the illustrations in Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. That way, you can, or little children can read a book that you know, has conversations and illustrations. As Alice says at the beginning of the work, of what use? Is a book that has no conversation or pictures or illustrations. So, Dodgson uh, got to Neil to provide these illustrations. Uh, Dodgson or Lewis Carroll, pen name, uh, <clears throat> drew some illustrations for Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, and some of those are in our edition of the book. Uh, Dodgson was not nearly the drawer as Neil. Here we see. Primary antagonist of the work, Queen of Hearts, versus Alice herself. Now, one thing to think about as we're reading this work right here is I talked about last time how the work can be an example of what it's like to grow up, to grow old, to work, grow into adolescence in particular. Um, another thing that it can represent is what does adulthood look like? a child, okay? Now, here we have Alice looking up to a picture of what she could be one day. This is like the a harsh criticism of what a matronly figure could look like in Victorian society. Perhaps if she stays in hangs out and does all the things that Victorian society says that young little girls should be. Perhaps she should grow up to be a queen, such as Queen of Hearts. Uh, here we have a picture of what it is like for a society to be run by a rash female who is driven by her histrionic emotions. So you could say that, you know, Carol is criticizing women and things, but that by showing a figure like this and how mad a woman run society would be. Or you could look at Alice as the hero of this work and say that, well, Alice doesn't end up growing up to be like the queen. As a matter of fact, she topples this type of image of what a woman could be, and she becomes the ruler of, that, of Wonderland and imposes order upon this nonsensical world because she has many great qualities, like imagination. And that's where we begin the story, is with Alice's ability to imagine. Uh, this is a little section from the introduction to your book, which I thought had some cool thoughts. This is on page Roman numeral 13 in your book. Uh, and this introduction is written by what's his name? Hugh Houghton. Uh, Hugh Houghton's introduction. In this introduction, Houghton says, um, well, he's quoting William Ibsen here. The Alice books are about growing up, which is certainly true, but they also, perhaps, are more surprisingly about grown-ups. Alice, after all, is apart from the fleeting baby, those stuffed archetypal schoolboys, Tweedledum and Tweedledee, the only child in the books at all. Like Henry James is what Maisie knew, the stories give us not so much an adult's view of childhood as a child's view of adulthood, seen through the lens of Alice. The world of, his, of adulthood is dismayingly bizarre and perverse, those of Dickens James. So, <clears throat> fairy tales of the time oftentimes were, of course, written by adults, right? Written by adults for children to show children how they should live their life. A lot of times, they would have a moral 
And they would say, this is how you should live your life. This is how you should do your life or else you'll be punished. Uh, <clears throat> but this work right here shows how a young child might view the adult world. And time and time again, the things that she sees in this world are bizarre and crazy and nonsensical, which is quite the opposite of what adults are telling her all the time. So I'm going to skip forward to the beginning of this work. Here we have an illustration at the beginning of the work of uh, the King and Queen of Hearts, King of Hearts, at the juror scene, the end of this work right here. Knave of Hearts, Stolen of Hearts, and Queen says, off with his head, just because he's been accused. White Rabbit reminds her, oh, no, 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 we have to have the trial first. But that's later on. The work begins, actually, with this little poem right here, which is a memorial to how the story was written to begin with. Uh, Charles Dodgson uh, <clears throat> oftentimes hung out with the Waddell family. Uh, and uh, this story came to be uh, whenever he was taking the three uh, young girls, they were of various ages, the, the youngest being eight years old, Alice. Uh, the others were teenagers, and he was with uh, their nurse, who was a grown adult. So there were two adults there, and they went out in the uh, canoe, and, and they would go out into nature, and he would tell them stories, and they would have a good time. Here, he remembers how. They encouraged him to tell this tale. The young girls wanted a tale with nonsense in it, as they were bored of their lessons. Uh, <clears throat> look at how little children are guiding this wandering. It's so wonderful because children are guiding this tale, not because uh, adults are. Harkening back to Wordsworth, how children oftentimes can guide us more more wonderful things than an adult can. We see the dream child of Alice characterized here. They half believe it's true. So they know that it's not true, but they are willing to suspend disbelief in order to have fun. That's one of the lessons of the work right here. If adults would be willing to suspend reality every now and again, we might be able to have a lot more fun, right? Have a better life. Um, so this is how the work begins with a hearkening back to that happy time on the banks of the river. There's a frame tale. Alice's Adventures in Wonderland is a frame tale. You've got to keep this frame tale in mind if you're going to understand what the work is really about. So the work begins with Alice hanging out with her sister on the banks of a river. Uh, and this is reality. Alice is in reality. Okay, She is hanging out with her sister and she's bored. Her sister is doing what adolescent young girls should do. Her sister's an adolescent. She's not yet an adolescent. She's eight or nine years old. Her sister is doing, reading a book that has no pictures or conversations in it because her sister has grown up past fairy tales. But Alice is at the point that she's still enjoying fairy tales. She hasn't grown past fairy tales. She's just learning her lessons, what she should be doing, what a young Victorian girl should be doing. But Alice is bored by this book right here because there's no pictures or conversations in it. What, what is the use of a book called Alice without pictures or conversations? 
And this makes us wonder, is Alice, you know, just naive? Or is she really teaching something that could be a lesson for all of us? And that's going to be something throughout this work that we might consider. Is this young child really naive, or does she know more than anybody else? Um, and then she kind of wanders off. And we later learn that she has fallen asleep. She sees this white rabbit. It takes the mind of a child, is one thing that I put up at the top, to be willing to go on an adventure. So what are the benefits of having a childlike mind? The ability to imagine. The ability to suspend disbelief. Go on an adventure. You see this white rabbit, which is just like any other rabbit, right? But then he pulls out a timepiece out of his waistcoat pocket and looked at it and hurried on. I've never seen a rabbit with a waistcoat pocket or a watch take out of it, burning with curiosity. She ran across the field. Here's a key character trait of Alice, if you're talking about the quiz right here, her ability, her curiosity. Um, hmm. You know, it might hearken up to the fact curiosity killed the cat. You know? Some other fairy tales might start with a young child wandering off into the forest, becoming lost, and then you know, finding all kinds of dangers. Is she punished in the end? Is she hurt? Is that okay? Uh, she's fascinated by these things. So she has fascination. She has imagination. All of these are character traits. She falls down the rabbit hole, which has nowadays become a metaphor for all kinds of things. When we go down the rabbit hole nowadays, we say, uh, well, I was thinking about something serious, and then I got distracted, and I went down the rabbit hole exploring that idea. And sometimes it can be a positive thing when it's characterized, other times it can be a negative thing. Uh, but we all have done this. One way or another, we all have gotten fascinated by a white rabbit or something that strikes us as odd, something that strikes us as unreal, and it drew our attention away from everyday things. Perhaps it led us into a wonderland. When we do that, it seems as if we're acting childlike. But I don't think that Lewis Carroll would say that acting like a child would be necessarily a bad thing. <clears throat> Here we get a little bit of criticism of Victorian education, I would say. When Alice is in this land of wonderland, I think it's important to notice how she tries to react this weird reality that she now faces. I think it's important to note that in a lot of fairy tales where you get women, especially, or young children, think about Grimm's fairy tales. Think about Cinderella. How is she saved by some magical force, by the prince? What? What's that? Yeah, by a man, right? Alice doesn't have a man to save her. Alice saves herself. Uh, <clears throat> but she doesn't save herself by reverting back to her education, right? Aren't we told that the way that we can get through the world, it's hard to make it in this world without an education. Who's ever heard that? Okay. Right? But when Alice looks back to her education, it doesn't help. She says, I wonder what latitude or longitude I'm on. Maybe I'm in New Zealand. Maybe I'm in Australia. She doesn't remember her lessons well, but at the same time, they wouldn't have helped her in figuring out the situation. 
it seems like time and time again, the things that little children are being taught in Victorian education might not really help them through the problems that they face in daily life. And in particular, the problem that Alice is about to face, that this dreamland that she encounters in many ways embodies is growing into puberty, into adolescence, growing into the adult world, that transitional phase. So Alice falls and falls and falls, but she's not a bit hurt. Which, you know, contrasts with the way a lot of fairy tales sometimes end. See a girl doing something that she probably shouldn't be doing, but she's harmed. Bad things come to her. And Alice anticipates that later whenever she looks at uh, the, um, the bottle that says, drink me. She says, I've read so many fairy tales where a young girl drinks a bottle that says poison. And then bad things come to her. <clears throat> Another uh, theme that we see is this uh, nonsense. This idea of nonsense, non-meaning, uh, <clears throat> of rules upended. Time and time again, Alice tries to find rules, tries to figure out the rules of Wonderland. She tries to make sense out of nonsense. But she consistently finds that these rules are meaningless. All right? So what does that mean? <clears throat> what can we make out of that? I mean, one way to interpret it is adults tell children that I'm doing this for a reason. I mean, have you ever had your mama say, why are we doing this? Because. Because I said so, right? There might not be a good reason behind some of the things that adults do, but adults tend to tell children that there's a reason for everything that everything we do makes sense, that a trial is just and fair, that <clears throat> adults don't make mistakes, that adults are constantly you know, in the right, and children need to listen to them and be obedient to them. But the reality is that adults oftentimes act irrationally. That adults act foolishly. And that's something that Alice seems to learn goes through this work. She, I mean, she encounters the queen, and the queen's willing to chop everybody's head off for no reason at all. Now, that seems absurd, but when you think about Bloody Mary, who this queen may very well represent, uh, Bloody Mary, a historical figure who killed many, many, many people because of their religious beliefs or because they disagreed with her. Bloody Mary very, may very well be the Queen of Hearts, and Bloody Mary was very much a real person. Hitler, I mean, Hitler wasn't around at this point, but killed millions of people for very little reason at all. Certainly not a good reason. So adults do some terrible things. Okay. <clears throat> Here is uh, where on page 13, this is still down the rabbit hole, the first chapter we see Alice uh, encounters this bottle that drink me. And here she remembers. She's learning from all the lessons that she got. These children, you know, who would not remember the simple rules their friends had taught them. Uh, so she thinks, oh, I need to remember these lessons I've been taught, all these things. Uh, but of course, this thing gives her an order, right? It says, do this, and she follows orders. She follows directions. But I mean, 
some crazy things happen to her when she follows the directions on that bottle. She grows tall. She grows huge. What a curious feeling. It must be shutting up like a telescope. Actually, she starts getting up small. She turns 10 inches. Then she eats cake and she grows big. She grows huge. She cries herself a river of tears because she can't understand what's happening. Um, and, and so a lot of people will interpret this as what it's like to start growing up. Literally, in body, that's something that happens when you hit puberty, uh, or when you're at this type of young age, something that adults don't really experience, but young, young kids experience. Constantly, their body is growing. You know, what to make of that? One of the things that happens to a young child is the child begins to question his or her own identity. Uh, and, and that's going to be a huge theme throughout this work right here. How, and especially in this parts that we read right here, Al, Alice continually asks, who am I? What am I? Because her body is constantly changing. One of the ways that people identify themselves is they, they say, I am who I am because of the way that I look. Right? But for a child, that's not a good determiner of who you are because your body is shaping, constantly shaping, uh, changing shapes. Alice tries, in, in absence of an adult, okay, to guide her, Alice tries to pretend to be an adult. She gives herself advice. She says, stop crying. It's not going to do any good, right? She pretends to be two people. This is another thing that Alice that characterizes Alice. She's fond of pretending to be, pretending is the key word right there. She's fond of pretending to be two people. Tending to be different people than she is. So she's constantly playing with her identity, whether she realizes it or not. She's scolding herself, just like an adult would if she was there. But that doesn't help her, uh, because she keeps crying. She cries because she can't understand what's happening. She eats this cake that says, eat me. And she says, well, I'll eat it. If it makes me grow larger, I can reach the key. And if it makes me grow smaller, I can creep under the door. So either way, I'll get into the garden. I don't care what's happening. So the garden that she's talking about, there, she sees the garden. She wants to get into it. And that could represent the Garden of Eden. And this represents her innocence right here. Because she assumes that when you see a garden, that this is a place that where, where happiness lies, where good things lie, where purity lies. But if you've read the book, you know she gets into that garden eventually, and that garden is ruled with the Queen of Hearts, where she's lopping off people's heads all the time, and there's mad hatters and crazy people everywhere she looks, and there's people abusing their children, and the Duchess abusing her little baby, which is a pig. Uh, it shows her innocence. Uh, <clears throat> children believe that this world that we live in, you know, uh, perhaps you know, that there is a Garden of Eden and things like that. But when they grow up and grow older, they begin to realize, well, the Garden of Eden is ruled by this crazy lady. You know? uh, <clears throat> she gets used to out of the way things happen. Another thing that characterizes Alice is that she's constantly planning right here. That's what I was talking about at the top of page 15. I'm going to eat this. She does this. She's going to do this. And that's her planning. But she's willing to eat the cake. You know, She's willing to take a chance. That's another way to care. <clears throat> this is one of uh, the drawings in the work there. She eats the cake. Certainly she gets bigger, but she turns bigger like a giraffe. Ah! Chapter 2. 
curiouser and curious. So time and time again, things we see from this work show uh, how distorted this reality is. She forgets to speak good English. It's not a good word. And curious is not a real word. Uh, she says goodbye to her poor little feet that she can't see. <clears throat> she has a silly conversation with her feet. She's trying time and time again as we move through this page to acclimate to the rules of London Lane, Wonderland, trying to learn the rules. She herself becomes a part of this world when she realizes what nonsense I'm talking. But perhaps this is one thing that distinguishes Alice from the other characters of Wonderland, perhaps besides the Cheshire Cat. She is able to realize the difference between sense and nonsense. She proclaims that she's speaking nonsense. And only at the end, whenever she is in the middle of that trial and all the creatures of Wonderland are attacking her, and she says, oh, you're only a pack of cards. Only when she declares reality upon this uh, crazy, unreal world, do things go back to normal. She hasn't realized yet that she is the ruler of this land. She is able to control this land. But of course, she's not done with fun yet. It's only when she does uh, put this crazy world under control that she wakes up from her. But at this moment, her head struck against the roof of the hall right when she declares that she's speaking nonsense. She gets to the edges of this unreal world. It's supposed to metaphorically represent how she's starting to grow a little bigger, growing too big for this world. She chastises herself again. In the absence of an adult, she chastises. She begins to question her identity as we move through this chapter right here. Who, what has happened to me? And this mirrors, you know, what happens to an adolescent. They're going through puberty. Who am I? What am I? What am I? What is going on? This world is crazy. You know? Starting to grow hair on my chest for a boy. Kinds of other things are changing, weird feelings, estrogen, weird stuff's going on. Am I the same person I was yesterday? That's the great puzzle. She begins to question, am I like any of these other little girls that I know? Have I been changed into another girl? We know that she's the same person. <clears throat> just doesn't want to be alone. She's tired of being alone. She just wants a friend. But I mean, ultimately, these changes are things that we all have to go through alone. Is I think one of the things that's being applied. Um, just like she's used to reading these fairy tales, and time and time again, there's kind of a metafictional aspect of this work right here, uh, which was kind of a uh, Challenging, kind of progressive at the time. This, we see a little bit, time and time again, of Alice realizing in some ways that she's in a fairy tale, that she's not in a real world. That's metafiction, beyond fiction, stepping outside of the rules and realizing that you're a part of a fictional world. And so she says, well, all of these weird things are happening. I'm going to be punished soon. She expects. poses because the little children, you know, a lot of times stop crying, act right, get with a program. And that's what's happened. Or else either stop crying or I'm gonna whoop you. I'm gonna give you a reason to cry. I've heard that said many times. So she assumes that she's crying and she's gonna be punished for it. She's gonna drown in her own tears, literally. About the but she's not. She gets out of it. 
So uh, she starts meeting these characters in Wonderland, and it begins with this little mouse here that, that that's having a swim in this pool of tears that she has cried while she was a big one, while she was a big little girl. Um, and she continue, She starts having these conversations with the characters in Wonderland. It begins with this mouse. She tries to relate to the mouse. She tries to make a friend. And she just time and time again makes mistake, makes social mistake after social mistake. And this can mimic, you know, how hard it can be for little children to start making friends, you know, with people who are not like them. The mouse is quite different from her. He does not like the same thing. He loves her little cat. But her little cat loves to catch mice. Uh, and so mice don't like little children. So one of the reasons why she can't relate is that she's unable to see through the eyes of these other characters. She's unable to put herself in their shoes. Uh, and so you know, she tries to relate, but what she comes off as rude uh, or unable to see things through their eyes. In chapter 3, we have a little game. All the characters are wet, and so there's a lot of hilarity going on in this section right here. We're able to catch on to the jokes. There's a lot of dry humor. <laughs> so they use dry humor to try to dry themselves off. There's a lot of plays on words in this work right here. Uh, <clears throat> And that, that accounts for a lots of the misunderstandings and nonsense that goes on. Now, Alice really loves games. Alice loves wordplay. Alice loves logic games and stuff like riddles, jokes. She loves things like this. But she begins to understand that not these things are fun sometimes, but she also begins to understand how frustrating they can be when you're trying to make sense of stuff. So th this adds <clears throat> another aspect to what she's learned as she goes through this world right here. So Alice is characterized as a, a character who has a sense of play. She's playful. She loves to play. She loves to engage in games. But the problem is, is that in Wonderland, all of the games don't operate by any set sort of rules. Anytime you try to pin down the rules in Wonderland, the rules are constantly slipping away from you. And a lot of this has to do that Alice has been taught that the language that she uses is a language that makes sense. Language makes sense. That's what she's been told. But Dodgson, Charles Dodgson, the actual real-life Lewis Carroll, was a logician and a mathematician. And he knew that words, a lot of times, did not always truly make sense. That they were not... Anytime you had a word, there was another meaning to a word. There was another way that it could be interpreted. And it depended a lot on all of these other things that were not set things. He knew uh, that, you know, uh, he knew that language constantly could be confused. There was no set rule. And so, this is one of the things that she begins to learn. She assumes that language always makes sense, but as she moves through this world here, she learns that language doesn't always make sense. <clears throat> she assumes that games always make sense, but as she goes through this caucus race right here, ruled by the Dodo, who a lot of people think is Dodgson himself, uh, or Lewis Carroll, she learns that, you know, these rules may be arbitrary, rewards may be arbitrary, uh, 
things like that. Okay, moving forward to chapter four. In chapter four, we get a lot of cool stuff going on right here. Uh, we get some more metafiction where Alice begins to think about the fact that she might very well be in a fairy tale. She gets stuck in this house, and because she drinks something, and she gets too big for the house. She says it was much pleasanter at home. So here is the point where Alice is beginning to change. She was bored on the banks of the river, so she began to use her imagination. But now she begins to realize, you know what? Sometimes this can be frustrating to live in a land of constant imagination. Sometimes the comforts of home are things uh, that we need. That's another way to interpret this scene. Well, now she's starting to begin to grow up, and so maybe she is, you know, maybe she's wondering, it would be much nicer to be a child. She says, it would be great if I was back as a child, as another way to interpret this, when I wasn't always growing larger and smaller and being ordered about by mice and rabbits. I almost wish I hadn't gone down the rabbit hole. Yet, and yet, it's rather curious, you know. Uh, going down the rabbit hole is a way to imagine what it's like as an adult uh, or an adolescent. That that seems pretty terrible right here. So, of course, if you look at what mice and rabbits are like or what they represent, the mouse, mouse was in a position of authority among uh, the uh, other characters in the caucus race. The rabbit is a picture of, uh, he's a messenger. Uh, and a bailiff of the court later on. Uh, he's a businessman. So all, all of these images of uh, what it's like to be an adult for her. And I'm going to read this last part here and then dismiss class. It talks about the frustrations, uh, or she talks about how our changing conception of fairy tales. I used to read fairy tales, says at the bottom of page 32. I fancied that kind of thing never happened. And now I'm in the middle of one. There ought to be a book written about me. There ought, when I grow up, I'll write one. I'm grown up now. Because she's bigger, right? She is having, a, recognizing the dissonance in language here. There, there's a difference between growing up physically and growing up mentally and physically. Uh, <clears throat> and she's reaching the limits of the fairy tale world, literally. At least there's no room for me to grow up here. Place right here. And this imitates the end of the frame tale itself. And I haven't taken a picture of the end of this book right here, but it's worth uh, bringing it up, kind of give you a conception of how the frame tale connects from the beginning to the end. At the end of this work right here, we see Alice wakes up from her dream and tells her sister all the things that happened. And her sister, who is herself an adolescent and has gone through all of these things, says and imagines that one day Alice is going to grow up and be herself a grown woman. And one of these days, she's going to keep, unlike the queen, through all her riper years, the simple and loving heart of a child. And she's going to gather about her little children and make their eyes bright and eager with many strange tales like this one right here. So she is, this is foreshadowing. One day, she is going to put herself in a book like this and tell these tales to these children. And perhaps she would feel all the simple sorrows and find a pleasure in all their simple joys, remembering her own child life. Happy summer day. Okay, 
So I want you to be thinking about some of these things as you're reading through Wonderland going forward. The next time you should be through chapter 7. This is chapter 4. Uh, and, and chapter 5, a really important chapter, I think, advice from a caterpillar uh, right here, this questioning of identity. Uh, another important chapter is the pig and pepper chapter where she encounters the duchess. Uh, and, and then later on, we'll get to the Cheshire cat in that chapter as well. So be thinking about these things as we go forward. I'll lecture on Wednesday and start to be thinking about your own input, second level analysis, stuff like that. Cool? All right, my friends, we'll see you next time.